Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, on behalf of EPFL, it's an immense pleasure to welcome you for this very special evening on our campus. 2019 is a very special year for EPFL. We celebrate our 50th birthday. And in the world of universities, 50 years old, we can think of us as if we are still a little child. And for those of you who have children, you know very well that one thing that kids are very relentless at doing is asking questions. And we find ourselves today, as a technical university, at the very heart of some of the most pressing questions of the century. There is no denying that technology has inserted itself into the very fabric of our lives. And so this evening is a good evening to ask questions, and maybe to try to provide answers. So we have assembled a very particular team of people, thinkers, to try to lead us towards the path of where technology is guiding us, what is the relationship between human beings and technology. And to explain you a little bit more about how this evening will unfold, please join me in welcoming Leila de la Rive. Leila <laughs> is the founder of the Empowerment Foundation and our partner for this evening. Good evening, Professor. I think I see you again in two hours. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Leila de la Rive. I am the founder and chairwoman of the Empowerment Foundation. We are living at a tipping point of history. Today, we are giving more and more away our freedom to algorithms, to data. We are living with robots, and maybe one day we will become robots ourselves. We are talking about augmented humans. So. We're living this particular moment in our history where we can choose between a utopian scenario or a nightmare. But the choice is ours. The Empowerment Foundation, recognized of public utility, is advocating for a human-centered technology, meaning that technology should serve us and not enslave us. We really believe that technology will lead to a more inclusive society where each and every one will have more happiness, wealth, and we hope we could live in a more healthy environment. But still, tonight, there are lots of issues to address. And we have partnered with EPFL together to welcome one of the greatest thinkers of this 21st century. He has brought three books that were, world, that were sold worldwide, Homo sapiens, Homo Deus, and 21st, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. He is a professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and he will help us to understand what the future of humanity will be. We hope so tonight. Before I call him to join me, I will just give you a few information on the program tonight. We will be joined after Professor Harari's keynote by uh, different um, participants, among them Ken Roth, the director of Human Rights Watch. We also have Professor Effie Vianna, who is coming from the ETH in Zurich, Professor Jacques Dubochet, that you all know. And we, ha we will have two um, leading professors of the EPFL showcasing their research, Professor Courtine and Professor Bloch and Professor Pike. And we'll be all discussing tonight among us and you, we hope, to have this debate about the impact of technology. So please, join me in welcoming Professor Yuval Noah Harari. Good evening, Professor. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this event. Uh, to discuss our future, hopefully our common future as humans. And maybe the most important thing to know as uh, human beings in the 21st century is that we are now hackable animals. And this is the result of the combination of two enormous scientific and technological revolutions, as a revolution in infotech and the revolution in biotech, which in the past decades have evolved separately, but are now combining uh, to a single revolution. 
which, as I said, results in really the ability to hack human beings. There is a lot of talk about hacking computers and smartphones and emails and bank accounts, but the really important ability is to hack the human animal. And this is based on the insight that is coming not from AI, not from infotech, but the insight that is coming from the biological sciences that organisms are really algorithms. And therefore, algorithms can hack organisms. Uh, for those who like equation, equations or understanding reality in the shape of equations, then the equation I can offer to understand what's happening in the world right now is B times C times D equals R, which means biological knowledge multiplied by computing power, multiplied by data, equals the ability to hack humans. Now, to hack a human being means to understand, let's say, me better than I understand myself. To understand what I feel, what I think, what I want better than I understand it. And once this is possible, it means that whoever understands me better than I understand myself can not only predict my decisions and choices, but can also manipulate my decisions and choices and increasingly take decisions on my behalf. It means the shifting of authority from humans to algorithms. Now, a lot of governments and corporations and institutions throughout human history had this ambition to understand and control humans. But it was never really possible because they never had the biological knowledge, the computing power, and the data necessary to do it. Even just a few decades ago, let's say the KGB in the Soviet Union, the KGB could follow you around everywhere 24 hours a day, uh, observing, recording, who are you talking with, where you go, what you do. But the KGB did not have enough biological knowledge, enough computing power, and enough data to really decipher what was happening within you, what was happening inside your body, inside your brain, inside your mind. Now, for the first time in human history, and if not now, then in 10 or 20 years, at least some corporations and some governments will have enough biological knowledge, enough computing power, and enough data to systematically hack millions and even billions of people. And if this happens, and if we don't take countermeasures, this could mean the end of liberal democracy as we have known it, and the end also of free market economics as we have known it. Um, liberal democracy is based on the inside that the voter knows best, and that the voter is the ultimate authority in the political field, and uh, free market economics is based on the idea that the customer is always right. That the ultimate authority in the field of economics is the desires of the customers. So the government, the political government, should represent the will of the people, and the corporations should serve the will, the desires of the customers. But what happens if the government and the corporation cannot just anticipate the will and desire of the voters and customers, but also manipulate and control them? And this is not a hypothetical question. And questions about human agency and about the very meaning of free will, whether there is such a thing, have bothered philosophers for thousands of years. There is nothing new about the philosophical arguments. What is new is the technology. We now have, or we will soon have, the technology uh, that will enable governments and corporations to manipulate and control the will of the voter and the desire of the customer like never before. And then who represents who? It's not clear. Again, I don't want you to think about it as a kind of doomsday prophecy because it's not inevitable. Technology 
always gives us options, not an infinite amount of options, but there are always different options. You can use the same technology to create very different kinds of societies. We saw this in the 20th century, when with the same technology of the Industrial Revolution, with trains and electricity and radio and television and cars, some people created communist dictatorships. Other people created fascist regimes. And other people created liberal democracies. They all use the same technology. It's the same with the new tools of the 21st century. Information technology and biotechnology can be used to create completely different kinds of societies, really all the spectrum from paradise to hell. The important thing at the present moment is to realize the true potential of these technologies and to really start the political debate about these issues. Engineers and scientists in places like this may realize the true potential of the new inventions, of the new discoveries. But the political system and most of the public has still hasn't realized what we are facing, what the new inventions and technologies really mean. So it's the job of historians and philosophers and social scientists to form a bridge between the engineers and the geneticists and the biologists and the general public and to really change the public conversation, change the political conversation. I think that this should be one of the most important issues in every elections around the world, in every public discussion around the world. And what I see as an historian, unfortunately, that too much of the political discussion in most countries around the world is focused on the issues of the past and not on the issues of the future, and that too many politicians are simply unable or unwilling to form a meaningful vision for the future of humankind. If in the 20th century, politics was a great battle between visions for the future, good, bad, that's a different question. But in the 20th century, it was very obvious that politics was about the future. And you had the communist vision, the fascist vision, the liberal vision, and the political struggle was a struggle between these visions for the future. Now, almost nobody in any part of the political spectrum offers a really meaningful vision for where humankind will be in 20 or 30 years. What, most of what they offer is really just nostalgic fantasies about going back to an imaginary past. Um, and this is a very, very dangerous situation because it really means that maybe the most important decisions in the history of humankind are taken either by a small group of specialists who represent nobody or they are not taken by anybody. They just happen. And this, again, may be part of this process of shifting authority from humans to algorithms. In 2019, it is still, humans still have agency, but we don't have a lot of time. Uh, within our lifetime, this shift, for, shift of authority from humans to algorithms might reach a point when most humans are simply incapable of understanding what is happening in the world. Even most governments and heads of state will not be able to really understand what is happening in the world. And more and more decisions will be taken on our behalf by algorithms, which is why the question who designs these algorithms and on what, an eth on, in, in, on what ethical basis is extremely crucial. So I hope that the discussion we have today in the coming hour or so will help not just to enlighten us about these issues, but to really spark a public conversation and a political conversation about this. Because again, to, 
as maybe as a last remark before we really begin the debate, to take a long-term historical perspective, there is always a connection between technology and politics. Technology often defines what are the main political issues of the day. In ancient times, the most important asset in the world was land, and the most sophisticated technologies were the agricultural technologies, which was a basis for agricultural societies. So politics was largely a struggle to control land. Then, with the Industrial Revolution, the most important asset in the economy changed from land to machines and factories. And politics, over the last two centuries, increasingly became a struggle to control the machines, the factories, the industry. Now, data is replacing machines as the most important asset in the world. And the main political struggle is no longer about machines, it's about data. Those who control the flow of data in the world control the future, not just of humanity, but maybe the future of life itself. So I hope that this debate we are having today will help ignite or, or continue to ignite the public interest and the public debate about these issues. Thank you. So, Professor Harr, please have a seat. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll be spending those hour and a half together with all our guests. Um, I have to tell you, first of all, I'm a very optimistic person, and I really believe in the resilience of humans. But after I read Sapiens, <laughs> I felt a little bit desperate, I would say, because Sapiens are the greatest predators of all time. Um, am I right to be afraid? No, they are not the greatest predators. I would say they are serial killers. Um, so, lions thank you. and bears and sharks are much better predators than us. But when it comes to exterminating entire, you, in, entire species and entire habitats, there is nobody like us mm. in the world. Uh, even before the agricultural revolution, even before the first wheat field was planted and the first city was established, humans were already responsible for the extinction of about half the large terrestrial mammals of the planet. Um, so yes, there is a great cause for concern. We should really acknowledge that the future of most of life now depends on us and on the choices that we make. Mm -hmm. So we invent and we have made great inventions but also inventions that have a terrible impact today. Mm -hmm. We have invented electricity, we have in, in invented uh, nuclear fission, and a lot of inventions that we are paying the price today. Mm -hmm. Are we really that short-sighted as uh, sapiens? Can we not see longer than the f near f uh, return on the interest? Usually not. Um, some people as individuals are able to, to look more long-term, but human institutions uh, have a greater, much greater difficulty in that. And throughout human history, humans were always very, very good in inventing new things and manipulating uh, the environment, the, the, the rivers, the forests, the animals, other people. But they always had a big problem foreseeing what the full consequences of their actions will be. Uh, a great example is the agricultural revolution which the, you know, the, the um, uh, domestication of wheat and rice and chickens and cows and so forth. And when it happened, lots of people thought this is a great thing for humanity. But actually, for most people, life after the agricultural revolution was much harder than before. For a small elite, the kings, the priests, the emperors, they had a very good life afterwards. But if you were a simple peasant in ancient Egypt or in medieval China, your life was actually much harder than before the agricultural revolution. But it was extremely difficult to foresee the full consequences of that. And it's the same with the technological inventions of today, that um, nobody knows what will they actually do. 
to human society and even to the human body and mind in the next, say, 30 or 50 years. Mm. So, but is there a way to, I mean, at least if we don't know what's going to happen, with all the data that we have, with artificial intelligence, predictive systems, will it help to take the good decisions? Uh, I hope so, but you know, it, 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 it plays both sides of the game, because when you have more data and more computing power and more predictive power, then you think you can see further to the future, but actually exactly the same technology mean that the change is accelerating. So there is faster and faster change. So it's actually harder and not easier to predict the future. It was much, if we sat here a thousand years ago in 1019, it would have been far, far easier to predict the future than it is today. If we sat here a thousand years ago, I couldn't, of course, predict the political situation uh, in 1050. But I could tell you with great certainty what the job market would look like. Uh, what the economy would look like. 90-something percent of people will still be peasants. And so if you think about what to teach young people today, a good bet would have been teach them how to herd cows and make cheese and plant rice and grind corn. This will still be useful in 1050. Now in 2019, you look to 2050, nobody has any idea what the job market would look like and what kind of skills people will need. We have a lot more predictive power than a thousand years ago, but exactly because of that, the change is far more rapid. Mm. Um, and that's the paradox, in, in a way, of prediction and the paradox of knowledge. The more you have of it, actually, the more ignorant you become about the future. So then, how can we be more conscious and how can we act more consciously? Because um, we, we're scared of, uh, nobody knows what's going to happen. In fact, nobody can predict, as you said. Yeah, so um, I think it means a couple of things. It means that you have to hedge your bets. Uh, in terms of education, it means, for example, don't teach young people a particular skill. Don't place all your bets on the idea that this is what people will need in 2050. They will need to code computers, so let's educate them to do that, because maybe by 2050, actually, AI will be able to code better than humans, so this will not be necessary. So it's a far safer bet to teach young people uh, resilience and mental flexibility because we don't really know what kind of skills they will need to learn. We do know that they will, they will have to change. And similarly, when it comes to political and social systems, I think the key factor is, or the two key factors, is balance and cooperation. It would be extremely dangerous if too much power and too much data, and data now is the, uh, the raw material of power, if too much data is concentrated in, in few places, either in a few corporations or a few governments or a few countries, we need to, as much as possible, disperse power and data to more locations. And secondly, um, we need, again, another, another safe bet is that we will need global cooperation. The only way to prevent the worst case scenarios if, is if enough countries uh, cooperate on that. If not, what you get is an arms race, and over the last few years, especially the last two years, we have seen an accelerating arms race in AI uh, between the US and China, and a couple of other countries are joining in, and we are likely to see a similar arms race in biotech uh, soon enough. And if this happens, it means that it will be extremely difficult to prevent the worst case scenarios. Because even if you explain to people the dangers, everybody will say, well, we are the good guys. We don't want to do this dangerous thing, but we can't trust our rivals not to do it. So we must do it first. That's the logic of the arms race. And if we enter, and we are entering, a technological arms race in fields like AI, this is the worst news possible at the moment. We're going to talk about that later with Ken Roth. Mm -hmm. But uh, coming back to data, um, the fact that we are losing our privacy, our freedom every day, and we're giving our data away everywhere that we go, mm -hmm. um, how can we stay free? 
Um, first of all, we maybe need to realize that we, are not as we were never as free as we thought we were. Mm. Um, there is increasing evidence that if by free you mean free will, then this was always an illusion. Mm. Now, in the past, you didn't have to pay a high price for believing in this illusion because humans were too complicated to be hacked by external systems. So even a thousand years ago, many of your desires and decisions did not reflect free will. They reflected all kinds of biological and cultural factors. Mm. But uh, you could still believe in free will because nobody could really understand how you make decisions and nobody could manipulate people on scale. Now, free will uh, might become one of the most dangerous illusions in the world because the easiest people to manipulate are the people who believe in free will because they don't believe that anybody can manipulate them. If my desires, I mean, it should be, it's not a, a very complicated philosophical issue. Just the next thought that pops up in your mind or the next desire that pops up in your mind, where did it come from? Now, if you believe in free will, then you say, well, this just reflects my freedom. And that's the end of the investigation. You lose all curiosity and also all suspicion about where your desires and thoughts are coming from. You just answer, they, they, they reflect my freedom. But when you really look at it, I didn't choose to think this thought. This desire, where did it come from? If your curiosity is really uh, 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 aroused by this and you start investigating, you realize that your desire reflects um, a large number of biological and social and cultural factors which are not under your control, but might be increasingly under the control of somebody else. And um, again, philosophically, this was also always a fascinating issue. But now it shifts from the realm of philosophy to the realm of engineering and to the realm of politics, because now at least some corporations and governments are gaining the technology to manipulate and control human desire on a massive scale. So I would say about freedom, we should realize freedom is not something you have. Freedom is something you need to struggle for. Mm -hmm. If you start with the idea, the assumption that I have free will, any desire that pops out in my mind, this is my free will, freedom means exercising my desire, then you're already a slave. You're already a slave, not of your biological mechanism, you're already a potential slave of somebody who knows how to pull the levers of what really causes you to desire one thing and not another. If you realize it, and you start at least investigating what's really happening there, this is the road to actually fighting and gaining real freedom. But, but then if we compare your definition of free, free will to the fact that, okay, we have a gut feeling and that's maybe what pops up and we suddenly think, okay, this is what I think. But on the other hand, if you have all the information in your hand mm -hmm. to take a decision, why this decision isn't based on your free will? First of all, you can never have all the information, certainly not the amount of information that today are potentially available to an algorithm. Usually when a human makes a decision, humans make decisions on the basis of just, you know, three, four, five data points. An algorithm can make a decision on the basis of thousands and thousands of data so that points. that could help us to take the good decision for yeah. good. Yes, but this means that the authority is shifting from you to the algorithm. To take a concrete example, if I apply to a bank to get a loan, so 50 years ago or 10 years ago, or in some cases even today, my application goes to a banker who goes over some relevant files and information and takes a decision, usually, just two, three, four salient points about me. Maybe, if, maybe it could be something like my history, my credit history. Maybe it could be my race, my gender, my religion. All kinds of salient features go into this calculation and the human banker takes a decision. Now an algorithm can, and this happens already today, can go over thousands and thousands of data points. Many of them would seem to a human utterly irrelevant and in any case, a human can't uh, really engage with so much information. 
Uh, for instance, uh, there are cases today when such an algorithm, it uh, checks uh, when you um, uh, charge your mobile phone mm -hmm. and takes this into account when deciding whether to give, in, uh, to give you a loan. It mm -hmm. takes into account the day on the, of the week and the hour that you applied, all kinds of things that might seem irrelevant to us, but the algorithm can find some pattern there and take this into, into account. So first of all, it's, it, it's very difficult for us to compete in the amount of information. And secondly, even if we have all this information, our understanding of what's actually happening inside our bodies and brains is extremely limited and uh, is usually shaped more by mythology and theology than by science and, and, and biology. Uh, this is why I, I said earlier that it's not only about algorithms and AI. AI by itself can't do much unless it is linked to biology and to biotechnology. Because if, if you're dealing with something that has nothing to do with humans, then yes, AI without biology can accomplish a lot. But the moment humans enter the equation, you also need biotechnology. Mm -hmm. Even for a self-driving car to go on the road, a self-driving car must be able to understand human emotions. Mm -hmm. Now, we are very close to, the, to, to, to really the, the, the merger of biotech and infotech. We are still not there. I think that the invention that will really bring these two revolutions together is the biometric sensor mm -hmm. that translates biological phenomena into digital data. And once we, we have ubiquitous, cheap biometric sensors, then we have the real fusion of the two revolutions. And this will basically change the entire world. Mm. I'm still depressed, sorry <laughs> to say. <laughs> so uh, please, I would like to uh, welcome our panelists, Professor Efivayana, um, Ken Roth, and Professor Jacques Dubochet. Please join us on stage to continue this discussion with Professor Harari. <laughs> Good evening, Professor Vajana. You are coming from the ETH in Zurich. You are a digital ethicist, bioethicist, and you are uh, really specialized into health and how we use our data related to the health and gene sequencing and all those questions. Ken Roth, you are the director of Human Rights Watch, a leading NGO that is advocating to defend human rights everywhere in the world. We're a former prosecutor, <laughs> so we're going to also talk about leg legislation with you. And Professor Jacques Dubochet, uh, Nobel Laureate uh, 2017 in chemistry, and he's also, you are an uh, uh, environmental activist, we can say, so we're going to talk about environment tonight. So, Ken, um, I would like to uh, start with you, I think the mics are on, um, to talk about one major concern that is populism. Um, populism is on the rise um, and it has a lot of impact on our societies and our democracies. What is your vision, I mean your point of view regarding the rise of populism, the backlash on tech, on uh, also the environment uh, issues and the fact that technology may be used by, the, by those populist um, authorities will have an impact on human rights. Right, well, thanks, Lila. Let, let me quickly answer your question and then try to relate it to Yuval's points. Um, I mean, populism for me is a phenomenon in which leaders gain power by essentially demonizing some unpopular minority. It could be gays, it could be migrants, it could be people of a certain religion. And then once in power, they systematically go after the checks and balances on their authority by attacking independent judges, independent journalists, independent activists, the, the elements of democracy that ensure that an executive is accountable to the people. So that's, that's the essence of what populism is, the, the rise of authoritarians. And you see this you know, every place from Viktor Orban to you know, Erdogan in Turkey, Sisi in Egypt, Duterte in the Philippines, Trump. You know, there, there are plenty of them. Now, you know, to, to relate this to what Yuval is talking about, and, and I think that the, the technological innovation that has made it easier 
for populists to gain and maintain power today um, is the emergence of social media. And what that has done is allowed a much more tailored message. I mean, Uval's point is that, you know, this, this concept of free will is a bit of an illusion that we've always been subject, you know, to biological influences, but also to informational, to political influences. But in the past, um, politicians had to work through mediating institutions. Um, they would have a political party that would, you know, get rid of the Trumps and make sure that a more responsible figure was put forward. Um, whoever that person was would have to speak through institutions like the BBC or the New York Times, which would also filter the message, determine what an objective assessment of the truth was. Social media has broken that down. Um, anybody can get on social media and send the word out. They don't need a political party. And they can speak directly to people. They don't need the mediating institution of, of a, a media institution. So this um, you know, is a new form of influence. It allows anybody to have a voice. You know, whether that voice resonates or not is a product of their talent and their message. But it is a, a more dangerous moment. And particularly when the social media companies, because their algorithms are prioritizing engagement, and because we tend to engage with the more extreme, the more provocative, um, this process is fueling um, the, the kind of populist message, this, the messages of hate and fear that are driving people like Trump because that tends to be more engaging. You know, that's why people tuned into the Republican primaries three years ago. It was, it was entertaining. And that same phenomenon on Facebook or on Twitter drives people to these messages. And so we find that the algorithms, which are choices, you know, the, the, the social media companies could be prioritizing something else, but it's just less lucrative. They can sell ads the more you spend time on their, their medium. So they send you the provocative stuff. It tends to fuel this anti-liberal, anti-democratic voice that is gaining prominence in many parts of the world. Mm. Professor Harry, you met with uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, recently. Mm -hmm. Are you reassured after your discussion with him? Uh, <laughs> not really. I think that the problem is much bigger than Zuckerberg in person. He and others like him, they have built these immense machines and then now these machines are really independent of them to a large extent. So even if he personally uh, changes his mind or uh, has a positive vision, uh, the machine is uh, not necessarily responsive to that vision. And I completely agree that now one of the biggest competitions is the competition for human attention. <coughs> this becomes a very important resource. Everybody's competing for that. And the easiest way to grab human attention is by pressing the fear button or the hate button or the anger button. And because the entire um, uh, commercial system or business model of these social media giants is, uh, is based on grabbing people's attention, they are almost forced to, to do these kinds of things. And so I think it's, it's much, much bigger than any individual person and his or her vision. Um, and we need to really change the basic model of the social media industry and of the tech industry. I mean, the, the, the really annoying thing is that there is actually so, it's not a lot of money. They don't make so much money out of these advertisements. It's amazing to think what political damage is being done for so little money. Mm. Another major concern, if we can say so, or at least a point of discussion, is Ch China. So, Professor Harari, I'm quoting, maybe it's not right, but China is behaving like an adult who is tackling the issue of climate change and the global agreements needed to contain it. Mm -hmm. This is what you said, and on the other hand, can you see China as a country where human rights are highly at risk? So can we mediate between your two visions? No, it's just complicated. I mean, you know, a country can be uh, positive and proactive in dealing with one issue and being backward and negative dealing with other issues. But maybe we have a bias in the way we see China. So maybe you can help us to see it differently? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, I think that th uh, certainly in, in the last few years, 
there has been this rising hyster hysteria about China, that China is gaining on the West, on the USA, on Europe, in economic terms, in technological terms, and this is fueling the current mentality of an arms race. And um, I think that, again, the greatest danger is if we allow this mentality of an arms race to, to take root, um, because then it means that we can do very, very little about regulating the dangerous technologies. Mm -hmm. Whatever you warn people about, they will say, yes, we don't want to do it, but the Chinese are doing it, so we must do it also. And when you go to the Chinese, the Chinese will say, yes, we know it's dangerous, but and we don't want to do it really, but the Americans are doing it, and we can't allow them to be ahead of us. Now, what really happened, I think, also in the last two or three years is that America, the United States, has voluntarily resigned its position as leader of the world and as leader of the free world. Now, you can argue to what extent it really fulfilled this role, but for decades, it at least aspired or pretended or claimed to be the leader of the free world. And then in 2016, basically, the Americans came and say, we don't want this role anymore. We don't care about the world. We only care about ourselves. We don't see ourselves anymore as leaders. Nobody would follow a leader whose motto is, me first. And um, I still find it difficult to understand why it happened. And it could have been just an historical accident, but it doesn't matter. It already happened. And the rest of the world, in, in Europe, for example, can't wait. You know, for decades, despite the upheavals in the American political system, there was a big partisan agreement that it doesn't matter who is the party in power, America still at least claims to be the responsible adult in the world and the leader of the free world. And now this uh, big partisan agreement is broken. And the world cannot wait every four years to see who the American public will elect next time. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, good, the good thing about it is that it forces other countries and other areas like Europe to take more responsibility. And maybe Europe can be a kind of mediator or, or a balance mm -hmm. uh, to try and prevent a full-blown arms race in AI and other technologies between the USA and China. Mm -hmm. Ken, maybe you want to talk about uh, public privacy. You've just published something related well, let to me, that. Let me talk about China here, because, uh, I mean, what you've always talking about, you know, what, what is the dystopia of the future going to look like? The clearest, really, way into that dystopia is if you look at China today. Um, and that's because China has become an uninhibited surveillance state. It is a government that faces no domestic constraints. It's a dictatorship. Um, it has been able to silence public opinion. Um, there is not huge pushback. And so it is operating in a way that, you know, whether it's the Silicon Valley companies or, or various intelligence agencies wish they could operate. And let me give two examples of this, and this will illustrate it. One is Xinjiang, the other is the Social Credit Index. Um, Xinjiang is the region in northwestern China principally where um, Uyghur Muslims live. And the Chinese see the Uyghur Muslims and other Turkic Muslims there as a security threat. So they have imposed a surveillance state like a sort that exists no place else in the world today. Um, they have police who run around with little handheld devices. And uh, my organization, Human Rights Watch, actually just reverse engineered one of those devices to see what does it show. And it shows that you know, any police officer can gain access to basically 11 pages of data about every individual in Shenzhen. And this will show everything from their political liability to you know, who they hang out with, who their family members are, what their blood type is, how much electricity they consume, what happens if their phone ever goes dark, you know, all these supposedly suspicious activities. And it'll then indicate, is this a person who should be interrogated, somebody who should be detained, what have you. That system has led to um, one million Uyghur Muslims being put in detention for re-education. Um, now, one million out of a Uyghur population in Xinjiang of 11 million. So basically, approaching 10% of the population, obviously a larger percentage if you exclude children, are in detention today because according to this intensive surveillance state, they were deemed um, unreliable.
they were too religious, they were too critical of Xi Jinping, what have you. So that shows you, you know, what happens when you have a, a government that is determined to surveil for security purposes with no inhibition whatsoever. Now, they're beginning to roll this out across the country. And the form it's taking nationwide is something called the social credit index. And the brilliance of the social credit index is that it's a method of control that doesn't usually even need imprisonment. Because what it will do once it's operational, and they're moving very quickly toward this, is that everybody in the country will have a score. And it will be a score in part social reliability, you know, do you take the garbage out, do you keep your yard clean, are you a nice neighbor, you know, innocuous things, do you jaywalk? But also political things, you know, do you criticize the government? Do you hang out with people who criticize the government? Do you, do you appear on panels like this, which would definitely work against our score? Um, you know, are you in the audience? You know? um, and everybody gets a score, and then the government allocates different social benefits according to your score. Do you get to live in a decent city? You know, there are finite good cities in China. Depends on your score. Do you get to send your kids to a good school? Do you get a passport? Do you get to travel on the bullet train? Do you get to see the latest movie? You know, these little things that people want depends on their score. And so suddenly, because people want these things, they're gonna start adjusting their behavior. And it's an, a brilliant method of social control that only in the extreme cases needs imprisonment, and otherwise it just controls paper, uh, people on the basis of data, the kind of thing that Yuval's talking about. So this is where we're going if we don't control it. And we're not gonna put the genie back in the bottle in terms of you know, making it impossible to collect the data, making it impossible to analyze the data, but we have to develop rules of privacy, of data protection, that say that there are certain things governments can't do are not allowed to do with your data. And it's not gonna start with China. There are gonna be outliners. But if we can, and this is something that Europe could be good at, um, if Europe can develop you know, a strong system about the limits of big data analysis, the limits of applying artificial intelligence to your personal data, um, it would help to counteract this trend that otherwise is there and governments are inevitably gonna move towards because this is a dictator's dream. You, know, you can control your people without even imprisonment. Why not? You know, so I, I think that you know, we see where we're going and it's up to us whether we're gonna prevent us from getting there. Ken, uh, we are here at the EPFL, but also technology can be used for good, also to prevent violation of human rights. Uh, maybe can you talk a little bit about what you are doing now at Human Rights Watch on that side? All right, well, just so we're not all negative news. <laughs> you know, there, there, there actually are good things you can use technology for, and I'll, I'll make this brief, but you know, Human Rights Watch, we, we have what we call researchers, basically investigators based around the world. And so you know, whenever there's a, a war, wherever there's repression, you've got people on the ground who, who investigate and report on what's happening, and we shine a spotlight on governments and put pressure on them to change. Now, governments have figured out that one way to stop us is to try to block us from getting to the site of the crime. Or sometimes it's just too dangerous to get there. And so we've actually been working with EPFL to develop a remote sensing capacity. Um, in part, it's using satellite imagery. Um, there's a, a Silicon Valley-based company called Planet, which is basically, they, they, they take a picture of the world every single day. And they've handed us a million dollars worth of imagery, which is basically all we could use. And it enables us to say, you know, these villages were burning down, or the, you know, the Rohingya told us the Myanmar army burned down these villages. Can we see the pictures? And you can actually watch day to by day as the villages are burned down, the bulldozers come in and clear away the rubble, and you completely corroborate the testimony of, of the Rohingya refugees. Incredibly powerful stuff. And we've done this in northern Sinai for the counterterrorism operation there. We've done it in northern Iraq. We're, we're doing it now in northeastern Nigeria. And what's interesting is we're combining the satellite imagery with AI because we now have way more imagery than we can possibly analyze. You know, we've got a couple people in Geneva trying to look at all this, but you know, there's a limit to what humans can do. But we are training computers to look at massive amounts of, of imagery in certain hotspots around the world and to tell us day to day, did something significant change? So that we can have an analyst look at it or send a researcher on the ground to see it. And what this has allowed us to do is even if we can't get there, you know, even if governments have blocked us, even if, if, if it's too dangerous, we can observe a lot of what's happening and call out governments for their misconduct. So do, do you have uh, other examples of 
to take uh, use for good, like this one that you've seen with all the. If you've all oh. the questions for, sorry, have you have you other examples that you are like? Did you yeah, I mean, myself? obviously, I mean, I, I usually focus on the bad side because that's my job as a historian and a social critic. Uh, you can count on the entrepreneurs, on the CEOs, on the engineers to publicize all the wonderful things that the technology can do. So yes, I mean, to give one obvious example, if you think about self-driving vehicles, so every year about 1.25 million people are killed in car accidents and traffic accidents. And most of these accidents are caused by human error. So self-driving vehicles are likely to save a million people every year. And that's wonderful. Similarly, with the combination of AI and biotech can provide billions of people with far better and cheaper healthcare than ever before in history. So, I mean, if there were, if there were no positive potential, it wouldn't be tempting. Mm -hmm. There is enormous positive potential, uh, but again, it's, it's the job of historians and, and social critics to shine a light on also on the, on the dangers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like also to, to, to comment on, on what you just said, that I think it is extremely dangerous what we are seeing developing in Xinjiang and in other places around the world. And again, I, I think that this part of the, of the reason I fear the arms race mentality is that this will um, amplify it and spread it around. I mean, if the legitimacy for a government like the Chinese government to do something like that to its population increases, the more it can present itself as being in a life and death, death struggle against an external enemy. And then also when you look at other countries like the US, like Europe and other countries around the world, um, which maybe will not be able or not even be, uh, not desire to implement such a program in their country, if they are caught up in an increasingly escalating arms race, uh, and again, this mentality of it's us and th or them, uh, there is no third way, then this will lead to the continual spread of, of this kind of technology. And the Europeans will say, yes, it's, it's, it's a very frightening idea, but we cannot allow ourselves to remain behind. Uh, not just in terms of the, of the technology, but also in terms of the economy. If the social credit system means that Chinese companies, let's say, are far, far better than European companies in hiring people and hiring the right people and motivating them and getting the most out of them, then you will see increasing pressure from European corporations on governments telling them, you must allow us to do it here, something like that. Otherwise, we'll go bust and the Chinese will take over. So what do you want? And this is why I think that the logic of the arms race is so, so dangerous. Professor Vaena, you want to add something? And then we go to the augmented humans. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, I've been thinking about your point of you know, the arms race kind of concept. And precisely what you're saying is what happened. In every conference I go and I talk about privacy, people tell me, well, if you have privacy, you won't have good technology. And the issue is presented as a conflict between innovation and progress and a human right, because I, you know, I go back to the human right of, of, of privacy. So it seems to me very difficult to get out. I try to convince people we, get, we have to get out of that, of that um, let's say, you know, a conflict, but it seems to me very difficult. And I find this not only in the political discourse, I find that in our institutions. Mm -hmm. I am in a technological institution myself. I talk to scientists all the time, and I get that division. It's either that or the other. So, and it fits exactly into what you are saying about, you know, arms race. If we don't do it, somebody else. If we don't do innovation, then somebody else is going to do innovation. So I'm trying to see, and that's my difficulty. Maybe you have a comment on that, actually. Mm -hmm. How do we get ourselves out of that binary thing, thinking that it's either or? Um, how can we finally start thinking that if we do have privacy, if we do respect those basic rights, then that's the kind of innovation we want, rather than some vague sense of innovation that's going somewhere that we don't know where it is. So mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I'm asking that, I mean, more than, than you, but because you're bringing up the arms race and how to get out of this, do you have an idea of how to get out of that? Um, 
I mean, the basic idea, and maybe, maybe it will happen. Maybe it's, it's, it's inevitable, it will happen, we'll get into the arms race situation and then we'll see what happens, but we are still not fully there. There is still time to, I think, to, to reverse course. Not a lot of time, but there is still time. And to realize that actually people say in China and in Europe, in the, U in the US and other, other parts of the world have common interests and everybody is going to be hurt if we enter this kind of, of accelerating uh, arms race. And that actually this idea that um, we have to do it, otherwise we are being left behind. To, to give an, an, an historical analogy, in the 19th century, we could have had the same discussion about, say, uh, kids working in coal mines. So you would meet with the head of the big companies in, of, of coal in a place like Britain, and they will tell you, well, yes, sending kids to coal mines, this is not, we don't like it, but the Germans are doing it. If we don't do it, we'll go out of business and the Germans will take over. What do you want? And eventually people realized, actually, it's better both for the Germans and the British if the kids go to school, not to the coal mine, and it's good even for the economy. Even the economy flourishes if you have a more, now for us today it's obvious, but it wasn't obvious at all in, 80, 50, in, 18, in, in, in 1850 that it's better to send the kids to school and you won't be left behind in the economic or military arms race if, if you do it. And I think it's also the same with issues like privacy. There are extremely high costs to pay also economically, for completely eroding uh, human privacy. But uh, when you are caught up in this uh, uh, mannequin battle between good and evil, you feel that you have no choice because the other side is gaining on you. So let's come to augmented humans. You have talked about your vis vision of augmented human. Uh, Professor Variana, are we there yet? Can we talk about augmented humans? Okay, so I, I need, a, I guess, a better definition of what we mean by augmented human. Exactly, human. what is the definition? Because um, mm. if, you know, those of us who have contact lenses or wear glasses were slightly augmented in the sense that we can see better, we wouldn't be able to see better. Um, I, myself, and many others in here fought a lot of infections over the years, so we're here today. We boosted our immune system, we killed bacteria, mm. and we're alive. So we did better than we would have done had we been left on our own. And if you look at scale, um, for, you know, it's not long ago that the life expectancy was about 45 years old. Now we live to be, in this country actually, one of the better places to live, uh, we live to be 85, 86, and we did quite well, we, we like that. So I think in many ways we augmented our, our, ourselves. Now the question I think in, uh, in, in the augmented human is, which fr where is that threshold where we have a norm and you know we boost ourselves to reach that norm because we were below, or where we start be going above that norm? And, and my feeling is that we keep changing that threshold. Mm. Um, now the bigger question is, how do we determine that move upwards, I think, because you know having now you know, wearing glasses or having la laser surgery or whatever, that's something we agreed is okay to do. Everybody will have it. We're trying to make sure that everybody has it, not just a few people. But when it comes to other things that are going beyond what would be the norm, then I think the conversation is becoming complicated. Now, in what you were mentioning, of course, we're taking, you know, we're taking augmented at a different kind of, uh, of level with the convergence between the computational and, and the biological. And I think one example that we talk a lot about these days is the genetic engineering, right? Mm -hmm. If you're able to um, intervene to that extent that you change the very core of, of, of humans in a way that you want, because we do change over time, but um, how would it be if we could change our genetic makeup? And we had examples um, last year, the, the babies born in, in China were uh, the, the, the Chinese um, scientists actually made that step and tried to, to, to make that change. Is that augmented? Okay, so what he tried to do, for example, was to produce babies that would be, um, uh, wouldn't be susceptible, with genetic um, editing, that wouldn't be susceptible to uh, acquiring HIV infection. 
okay, we have other means to do that as well, but let's say, is that the kind you know, of augmentation that we are not sure if that worked, we have so many other risks. So if that's what you mean by augmented, I'm not sure how close we are. So, and, and, but as you said earlier, I mean, if we look forward to 50 years in the future, I think a lot of what we define even broadly as augmented will probably be getting closer to. Would you recommend um, strict regulation on that, Professor Harari? <laughs> yeah, no glasses for anybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the key no, on, the, on the threshold, and then what what what, yeah. what should be the limit to put? Is what we call enhancement above mm -hmm. that, right? Mm -hmm. So, right. Yeah, I think that the, the key issue is what kind of changes you do that allow many people to reach a certain norm, and what kind of changes you do that allow a small part of the population to exceed the norm. There are, there are two different projects here. Now, there is no clear technological and scientific line uh, between them because very often a technology that can help people reach the norm can also help some people exceed it. Uh, the key point is how do we make it available uh, to, to the masses of the population? Otherwise, we end up with biological costs, with a, maybe a small cost of enhanced superhumans and a massive population of just normal homo sapiens, which is increasingly left behind. Uh, previously in history, you could not really translate economic inequality into biological inequality. To some extent, yes. Rich people had more food, so they were taller and, and, and so forth, but the basic human abilities, there was no real difference between the daughter of the king and the daughter of the peasant. But in 50 years, we might reach a point, if we are not careful with regulation and so forth, when we can actually, when humankind might split into different biological castes. And this is something, again, it's a political issue. Scientists should be aware of the, of the possibility, but ultimately, it's the responsibility of governments and citizens to think about it and to prevent it from happening. Mm. Do you want to add something? We, what we know from history is that technological advances are not equally distributed. We know that. Even if it's not the enhancement, if it's not the extra thing above the norm, things that are, would allow people to reach the norm, not all of us have them. And we have big parts of our world that don't have them. So if we were to judge by that, I would say it would be very difficult to imagine that all these advances would be suddenly equally distributed. And I would be very concerned about that as well. And so the question is, if, if how much that consideration becomes part of how we decide for what we are going. So if Project X seems fantastic, it is brilliant, our curiosity will be met and we'll be you know, thinking that we are superhumans. Is that the project we're going to pursue, provided that that's an outcome that we know it will benefit only a few? Is that a consideration that we need to be taking into account when hopefully we make decisions and not decisions are made by somebody else about which kinds of innovations we're after and which kinds of technological projects we want to pursue? We're going to talk a little bit later on with Professor Courtine Bloch and Pike about that. Professor Dubochet, um, you are very concerned about the climate change. You are an uh, environmental activist. Do you think that, um, and you've been actually with the kids on the streets to protest against the non-reactivity of our politicians. So do you think that we, the people, can be agents of change in tackling those environmental issues? <laughs> yes, they can. Um, we are not going to have in concurrence you horror with my horror. I take your horror very well. Um, uh, human animal being at present already hacked. And uh, the society, the value I share are in great danger. That's, I agree, I see with you. Um, and I read your three books, they are very good. <laughs> um, but, well, my problem is climate. And since a long time, since ever. Uh, and uh, I saw with horror how little we could do with that. And you see, with horror, 
how little we can do with you, horror. And uh, I was, we were thinking, thinking and discussing this yesterday in family, and mm -hmm. we remember that uh, Al Gore was a vice president of the United States up until 2001, if I remember correctly. And he was a powerful person. A few years later, he brought the film The Inconvenient Truth. We knew all that, and nothing happened. Nothing happened, but I have my heroes now. Huh? Greta Thunberg <laughs> in, in uh, uh, August last year. It changed a lot of things. Huh? Or at the same year, at the same month, uh, Aurelia Barrault in France. Hmm? Aurelia Barrault will be here in Lausanne, the 3rd of October. Great. And uh, now, here, I see something changing. And these young people are saying, it doesn't work like that. We don't accept this. And I, can, I have the hope that this movement gets strong enough to save our climate, but they are clear. They say, it's not a matter of changing the climate, it's changing our society. And they say it very strongly. And I hope that on the move about the climate, they will save us from becoming slave of hacking. That's my hope. <laughs> A quick question on that, Professor Hari. Glo global cooperation is needed, but we also know that it's very a slow process. Mm -hmm. It takes ages to have uh, international treaties. So, what other solution do you see? The civil society rescuing uh, the environment. What other solution do you see, uh, like Professor Dubosche? Well, in, in terms of the climate, and yes, there are many things that individual countries can do, and many of these things are not even bad for the country. I mean, I, I think we should get out of this kind of, again, binary thinking that the only way to stop climate change is to destroy the economy. If this was the case, then there, was, there would be no hope. But I think it is possible to um, uh, spread prosperity and at the same time to have far more responsible environmental policies. But again, the problem is that there is a limit to what individual countries can do unless you get at least a substantial majority of the main countries on board, um, it will be extremely difficult to prevent the worst outcomes of, of climate change and of the ecological crisis. And again, this goes back to the issue of inequality, that climate change will have a very different impact, at least in the short term, on different countries and on different social classes. So some countries and people are extremely concerned but other countries are not concerned or even quite happy with the direction that uh, the, the climate is taking. And um, I, I, again, I, 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 I might try to be optimistic about it, but in the last few years, the world has been running in the opposite direction. I mean, maybe 2015, if you think about the Paris Agreement, 2015 was really the, the last year that the Paris Agreement was even possible. It was like a, a kind of small miracle that they didn't delay it by one year because then it would have fa fa fallen apart. And since 2016, the really the world has been running in the opposite direction. So I hope we can reverse course in time. Um, and again, the main problem is that maybe there is no we when we talk about climate change. Mm. Just as with human enhancement, there is no human we. We are talking about different human groups with different futures and humankind splitting into different maybe biological classes. Similarly with climate change, part of the problem is that there is no human collective. There are different groups with different futures. So now I suggest that we go to the last part of our discussions. And please welcome Professor Courtine and Professor Bloch on stage so that we can talk about their research, what they're doing. Professor Courtine is our specialist into neurorobotics uh, at the EPFL. I'm just taking my notes because I don't want to 
say uh, he's a leading expert in neurotechnology, and Professor Block is uh, a leading expert in neurosurgery at the Shuv. Thanks for being with us. Good evening, and I will start by apologizing because we're going to be a little bit provocative <laughs> based on the recent discussions. And I will start by introducing David. David, nine years ago, had a gymnastic accident. Mm. And now when his brain sends a command to activate his muscle, the signal is interrupted, leaving him paralyzed. Nevertheless, when we study this kind of injury in rat model, we always find some spared nerve connection. You see them here in white. However, they are functionally silent, meaning that the rat cannot activate his muscle in order to walk. And for the past 30 years, in order to restore walking, scientists have been trying to grow more of this kind of fibers. We thought about the problem completely differently. We actually focused on the region of the spinal cord below the injury that is completely intact, but disconnected from the brain, meaning it's missing key source of modulation and excitation in order to be functional. So we thought to hack the spinal cord, take advantage of advances in technology, in order to reactivate the spinal cord with electrochemical stimulation that will mimic the way the brain activates the spinal cord. This is a parallel rat. Stimulation on means it's turned on. When it's turned off, it can't walk. Back on, and the rat walk immediately. And that was the time when we decided to do exactly the same therapy, but in human being. And my role was to implant an electrode array on the spinal cord at the region that is controlling the legs and to connect it to a sophisticated pacemaker that is able to deliver bursts of stimulation that will be located exactly at the right place and also at the right time in order to co coincide with the intention of walking of the patient. So here you have David again. David, at the beginning of his therapy, with the stimulation on. You see that it's turned on, he walks, turned off, he cannot walk. We turn it on again, and he walks again. So that was very important. Yeah, because now he can train. Yes, he could train, trained intensively, very intensively, and six months later, he was able to turn on his stimulation, talking to his watch. Stim on. Okay, start message sent to implant. And this allows him to walk outside the laboratory. However, at this stage, David cannot control the stimulation on his own. So we had the idea to connect the thoughts directly with the stimulation. Mm -hmm. Do you think it is science fiction? Yeah, and here we hacked the brain, finally. <laughs> so here I implanted electrodes in the brain region that is controlling the leg movements. And with this electrode, we can record the brain activity, build algorithms that detect the intention of the animal, and we link them wirelessly to the spinal cord stimulation system. So this is the model of transient paralysis. The right leg cannot move. Without any training, the animal just think about walking, and we connect the digital bridge to the stimulation, and he walks continuously just thinking about it. As long as it's on, he can walk. We turn off this digital bridge, and he cannot walk. So let's dream with me. Let's project ourselves 50 years from now. Imagine someone. The computer turned off. Turned off. <laughs> <laughs> this is when the technology is not helping. <laughs> Can you somehow restart the video? Okay, or I just yet. make magic mimicking? Yeah. Someone so hacked the system. <laughs> Im ima imagine the future <laughs> when 
this kind of technology can go to humans. So, you know, someone will have a spinal cord stimulation system. We will also need more connection. So we will have, you know, gene therapy, all the stem cell therapy to grow more connections. Mm. And maybe oh, no, it works. So this is the fusion of the future, 2050, as you said. The spinal cord stimulation system growing more nerve connections, so stem cell gene therapy, because we need more nerve fibers. In the same surgery, you can have this implant to record the brain activity, decode intention, and link them to this implanted device so that people can start training intensively, actively. And the technology becomes seamlessly integrated in the operation of the central nervous system to the point that David can now walk freely to his office drinking his coffee. And you know, at this stage, <laughs> It is still a dream, but 15 years of research took us one step closer to this dream, the steps taken by David and six other previously paralyzed participants. And, you know, now we ask you, <laughs> is it a progress for humanity? Should we continue in this direction? Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Professor Harry, what impact do you see at this hum human-machine interface for mm. humanity? I mean, the, the, the intention of this research is, is amazing and, and positive and can bring so much joy and happiness to so many people. On the other hand, what struck me about the research is that for it to work, you need to decode the intentions of the brain, which is exactly the, the issue of hacking human beings. So what do you do when you can hack, an external system can hack the intentions of the human brain? And so think about the politician you most dislike today in the world and ask yourself, what would he or she do if they had this technology to decode human intention uh, reliably on a, on a mass scale from, from outside? Again, it doesn't mean that we should stop all research in this area. Uh, we shouldn't, and, and we won't anyway. It does mean that we need to understand the immense political stakes that such technology involves. Mm. So, and also I think it means that the scientists who are working in these fields, part of, the, of their responsibility is to educate the public. To, first of all, to educate themselves about the um, social and political implications of what they are doing. Very often when you are in the laboratory and you're working on a particular project, then you only see the immediate project of the technical problems that you need to solve. So part of, of it is thinking much more broadly, what are the implications of what I'm discovering and developing, not for the particular problem that I want to solve, like how to enable paralyzed patients to walk, but what will this technology mean on a, a greater scale for society and for the, the, the political situation? And then to educate the public about these issues so that politics doesn't lag too far behind the technological advances. Mm, but there's a gap now, maybe Professor Viana, you can tell us more. There's a gap between the pace at which technology is evolving, and it's evolving very fast, and our response as politicians, legislations, there's a huge gap, and this gap will probably never be gathered. Mm -hmm. So how can we do, I mean, uh, the work you're doing, Professor Viana, what can you tell us about that? So anyway, fascinating technology, and uh, congratulations. Uh, that's about, you know, reaching the threshold of norm rather than enhancing. So I, I, I don't think there is, you know, something to, to, to say against that, but, um, it's absolutely true that we have such a fast pace in technology that our legal systems but, and also our societal norms cannot catch up. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a different, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, what we're seeing at the same time is that even if we cannot change instantly our laws, we have other softer means with which we can decide where we want to go. And I think, I have to say that although laws are the ones that 
you know, are going to, they have teeth, they can make us do things that otherwise we wouldn't be able to do. I think this conversation we're having in about, in, around, you know, what are our soft law tools mm -hmm. that can be a little faster in development, even if they don't have teeth. Um, I, I do have, um, hopefully not naively, quite a lot of hope in that. And we see also in the scientific community, in engineering communities, not just you know, out there in the humanities, um, people interested in asking those questions and wanting to, to set, a, st a, set a certain ethical standard. So I think at this, while we're waiting for our legal response to arrive, I think these other tools are useful and we have frameworks and systems that allow us, I think, to bridge, at least to some extent, um, that gap. The, the challenging question would be, how do we do that at a global level? Mm -hmm. um, how do we that with, of course, you know, um, the political situations and the different drives that we see in different continents and in different countries? But I have to say that, you know, looking at how, um, take the biologists, the gene editing community, all of those, I think they are, there's a lot of, I would say, sincere interest in, you know, developing the standard because it's not clear what the standard is. Mm -hmm. It's not that we got the right question, the, the right answer to should we do X or Y. That is something we're debating. Um, but I think the first thing is that debate, to have it, to ask the question, to have the debate and set the standard at the soft law still um, uh, um, stage before we get you know, more um, stronger response from, from regulation. Ken, you want to add something? Well, I, I agree with Effie that it's, um, laws are really just one tool. And you know, to take an example that we're all familiar with, um, today there's an expectation that when you buy a product that it will be produced with a clean supply chain. You know, that, that even if there's two or three layers between, you know, sort of miscellaneous sub-suppliers in your final product, that you're not going to find child labor there, you're not going to find forced labor, you're not going to find overt discrimination. And the truth is there are no laws that dictate that. But rather public expectation has come to demand that. And it's the possibility of a, a media expose or civic activism that has driven corporations to now abide by standards that go beyond the law. And, and those that don't are really dumb and short-sighted, and they'll get blown up at some stage in the media. So um, that is an example of, of the importance of, of you know, the public setting standards. Now, at the national level, laws still matter. I mean, some of the stuff you've always talking about, you know, if, if you go into the bank for a loan, the laws already say that there's certain things that the bank can't do. They can't say, oh, you're Muslim, you're not going to get a loan. You know, there are laws against that. So um, we need to enhance those national laws. And that's easier to do than to get global standards. But because of this arms race that you've all is talking about, we need global standards. And I think we've learned a bit about how to get there and how not to get there. The way not to get there is to insist on unanimity before you have a standard. And the example I'll give is, um, is landmines, which uh, my organization, Human Rights Watch, was very involved in pushing for the treaty on. And we actually shared in the Nobel Peace Prize when we got it. Um, we started off down the road in Geneva where the rules at the UN were unanimity. And needless to say, many governments, including at that stage the US and, and, and the Chinese and the Russians, um, didn't want a treaty banning landmines. So they were going to just talk and talk and talk and it would never happen. So we went to a few countries, Canada, Norway, and said, why don't you host a meeting where people who want a treaty can come and people who don't can stay in Geneva? And so they did that. And there was the Oslo process, where a group of people agreed on a treaty banning landmines. Said, leave the Americans and the Russians and the Chinese talking in Geneva, who cares? <laughs> um, we got the treaty, and the treaty, um, although it was not universally ratified, it was, say, at first ratified by 100 or so governments, it became so powerful in terms of setting public expectations and stigmatizing those who didn't follow the rules that even though the Chinese and the Americans and the Russians still haven't ratified the treaty, they don't dare use landmines. And the same thing has happened with child soldiers, with cluster munitions. We're trying to do it right now with, with, with killer robots, fully autonomous lethal, lethal weapons. Um, the key is to start with a coalition of the willing and then expand out. Now, what makes this particular topic, though, difficult is that, you know, landmines, we all know whether they're used or not. They go kaboom. It's easy. You know, you can see it. But what do you do 
if you're developing you know, a, a, a hyped up surveillance system. Uh, to some extent, we can know that that's happening. But a lot of it is hidden in code and hidden in back rooms, and it's really hard to know. And so I think the challenge that we face is how do you develop norms when we don't necessarily know what governments are doing? I think it's still possible. It's going to depend on still the possibility of, of local exposés, of, of pointing out where governments transcend the norms that at least most of the governments of the world have endorsed, and then making them pay a reputational price for that failure to abide. I think that's the way forward in terms of global standards, um, not unanimity. Mm. Just a quick thing. It's, I, I think, yeah. <laughs> yes to that. It's not just the governments, though. I think the powerful corporations, can they, they need to be subject to similar uh, scrutiny. Because at the, at the current moment, we have to look at those as well. And what we see in terms of, you know, what also Yuval was saying in terms of data control, flow of data, and therefore the development of technology is exclusively almost in the hands of some corporations. So their responsibilities are, are uh, important as well and they have to I go on a conversation. I, I totally agree. And corporations are very susceptible to public pressure, exactly. beginning with their employees who don't want to do this stuff. But one of the solutions shouldn't be decentralization. If we are scared of being hacked, we could give that to an independent body, decentralized body, and protect it from states or governments, or, and maybe go for more for a completely independent system from the state. To give what to an to, 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 to avoid, you know, being hacked mm -hmm. as humans. And if we give all our data and all our uh, very personal, mm, I mean, data to an independent body mm -hmm. that we can trust, that is not private, that is not public, but that is maybe a, an independent body, private public sector, is this something like decentralization could help to protect individuals? Uh, in, in principle, the more actors you have, uh, the more checks and balances uh, you can have. But giving all the data to one independent body, I mean, I don't think you can, tr uh, who will be this body? Who will decide what it will do? Um, it, it's more the most Im important resource in the world. It has to reflect somehow the desires and the values of society. So it cannot be completely independent of the government. And in any case, even if you give all your data to one body, it doesn't prevent other institutions and organizations. I mean, the, the data, um, and it's not like land. With land, if you have a piece of land and you give it to somebody, that's it. That person or that body owns that land. But with data, it can be replicated any number of times. So I can give my medical records to somebody I really, really trust. It will not prevent all kinds of corporations and governments from trying to get the same or even more uh, medical records, either by hacking that system or by independent means of surveillance. And with the um, uh, rapid advance in the technologies of surveillance, it's going to be almost impossible for individuals, even today, individuals have very little idea what kind of data is being gathered on them every moment without their knowledge. And even if they don't have a smartphone or an email account or whatever. Hmm. So now I would like to invite Professor Pike to join us on stage. Um, Professor Pike will talk about the latest research that she's done that has been just published today in Nature. Professor Pike is a soft robotic expert. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. I want to talk about the future of technology, the immediate future. Um, and I want to call this a recovery of robots. It's not necessarily because my lab is called recovery of robots lab, but it really is. So when I was studying, I thought the future robotics would be something like this. Now we're talking about killer robots and David, so maybe this is not the best image to show, but the movie had a huge impact. I did not necessarily want to create the next Terminator, but it was more to understand what is actually possible to do in terms of physical, material, and design-wise to create systems that can mimic human movements. So the eyes that move more like humans, and hands that move like humans, 
Again, not necessarily to create the next killer robot, but to understand the biomechanics of humans and to understand what can we do to better make the devices to work with humans. So one of the last studies while I was making that robot was to create a human arm, I mean, robot, uh, humanoid arm. It actually was able to create a very smooth motion, enough of momentum to even hit a tripod. So that's why the film is actually shifting at the end. This is really nice. But as soon as someone sees this, they're like, oh, great, Jamie. When can they start serving me breakfast or doing dishes and doing my homework? None. Zero. Even the motion is very similar. It does not have enough intelligence to understand what you want it to do. So I realized this is not the future of robotics nor the technology. The next generation technology and robots that would actually help us will be a system that's more interactive. Not necessarily it's using the data you're giving it, but because it realizes the environment. That required a huge change in the paradigm of design robots. It sounds really complicated, but it's not. You've all done this. Origamis. Origami is a really versatile design platform. You take a piece of paper, and depending on how you fold it, and when you change the sequence of folding, you can create a multiples of animals, uh, objects, and systems, or even just simple rhinosaurus. We took an idea from this uh, origami platform. Imagine having a robot that you don't really know what it needs to do immediately, because that's how the classical robots are designed. You know exactly what the task is. You want that robot to perform that task better than human, faster than a human, more accurate than human. But if you don't know what you want them to do, what kind of robots should you have? You rely on your additional help or an, another manual type of labor. So we worked on that idea. How about making a robot that does not know exactly what it needs to do, but interacts with the environment? It reconfigures not only its body from a flat sheet of robot to a self-morph into a three-dimensional robot that, in this case, crawls. It goes from point A to point B. But what if the environment changes? What if it's no longer flat? What can it do? Normally, the mission does not go on anymore because it's a different ground. But for Tribot, it's able to roll it over. Now you're attacking, attacked by the rough terrain. What if it's no longer just a rough terrain? What if it meets an obstacle? It will hop over. Again, it's interacting with the environment. It's the same hardware. Same controller, but it's able to interact with the environment. And it can even do gymnastics. It's a very simple example, but this is a valid objective robot. It takes the sensor information, it processes, but because it's re able to reconfigure its body, it's able to create different gait patterns. That's not it. We can, it does not necessarily have to be all a same flat sheet. We can make them completely modular as well. So instead of relying on a single sheet with a fixed size, we can create multiple modules that are either active with mo uh, motors and sensors and microprocessors, combined with inactive or passive joints. In this case, you see an empty triangle. And by combining them like Lego blocks, you can create not only a different size of elements, but a different platform that can interact with you, an environment. So does that sound like something that you'll be interested in using? Maybe not immediately, because you've never seen it before. So you don't know what to use it for. But there's a place that you really need this type of technology. Imagine if you have a robot that needs to go through an obstacle. In this case, we're showing it by showing a wall with a small opening. And the robot like this can transform its body to execute its mission. In this case, training it to a space shuttle. And space, speaking of space shuttle, space is the place where you need this type of solution. This is an artistic, artistic rendition of what you're talking about. To bring up one kilogram of anything, let alone water and food, it would cost you $100,000.
you can no longer afford to have automated system robot for a single task. You need a system that will do multitask. This is where RoboGamis can come in. Imagine having multiple modules that you don't know exactly what mission they need to do, but they're going to be there to help out astronauts. In this case, instead of sending astronauts out in the field, these are the robots that will go inside the ground, survey on top of the ground, and even above the ground. Not only that, they will interact closely with astronauts by providing a platform that is interactive, physically interactive with astronauts to communicate back with the Earth helping you out with experimentation on the space shuttle, uh, spaceship. This is not the distant future, because you can use the same origami platform that transforms its body from flat state to a three degrees of freedom force feedback haptic interface. What you're seeing here is world's smallest haptic interface that gives you force feedback underneath your fingertip. That's very mouthful, I get it. What does it mean by force feedback underneath your fingertip? This is an interface. If you were to link it back with your goggles, uh, virtual reality goggles, normally when you play with the um, um, uh, virtual reality system, what you see is what you get. Well, actually, you don't get it because you probably wave your hand in the air. But if you combine this with this haptic interface, which you're seeing just underneath the thumb there, these are no longer just blue ball that he's touching. It's a blue rubber ball, because you'll be able to feel the stiffness change. Now, it's not just a red ball. It's a red sponge ball. And as soon as you pick up the black ball, you'll be able to feel that it's not, as a billiard ball. The ceramics are much harder. Imagine using this interface to perform surgery. Imagine using this as a layman person, buying your avocado. You would know how hard that is. And since we're in Switzerland, Gruyere from Comte. It is reality now, because even though it does not look like your killer robot, these are robots that can enhance your experience online. So people often ask me, Jamie, those are really cool looking, but what's your main application? This is a wrong question now. You're living in the next generation technology-driven world, where the robots are no longer designed just for a single task. They are no longer optimized for a single task anymore. I really think the next generation robots are meant to do a multitask. They're optimized for multitasking that are highly interactive, that will bleed into our lives, not to take over it. We are able to keep our autonomy, but these will interact with us to maintain the quality of life that you desire. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Professor Harari, would you like to be surrounded by mini robots, origami robots like these ones? Oh, it depends <laughs> what they do. I mean, <laughs> uh, again, like every technology, it can be used for so many different purposes. But what strikes me, again, like in the previous examples, is that the really crucial point is not the robot by itself, but the ability of the robot to interact with humans in order to change the human experience. So for example, to feel through the robot uh, what some robotic arm is doing in another place. Mm -hmm. So this, again, it, it bridges the, the gap between the human mind and the human experience, our subjective experience, and the objective world outside. And once this gap is, is bridged, this is when the biotech and the infotech revolution really combine to completely change the world. We're slowly coming to an end. Um, obviously, you're on a mission. So what are the next steps for you now that you have the latest book that has, has been published? <laughs> what are the next steps? Um, the really key issue is uh, to change the public conversation, to focus the global conversation on the, on the most important challenges that are facing humanity. Uh, I see myself as a kind of bridge between the scientific community and the general public. Um, and so I, my, 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 next, my, my team's next uh, uh, big project is really how to widen the conversation. So write to children about it, write a children's book, uh, create maybe a Hollywood blockbuster about these issues. 
because uh, I don't think that it should remain an internal conversation of the scientific community. And these are the best ways to reach the general public. Maybe the main message to the scientific community is that the, just, as, just as the border between biotech and infotech is disappearing, so also whatever remains of the border between science and politics is also disappearing. And most scientists don't like to hear this message. Most scientists, they really want to do just science. They don't want to get involved in the messy issue of politics. But in the 21st century, science is the most important change factor in the world, in the economy, in society. So it is also the most important political factor. So on the one hand, politicians and voters should be uh, far more educated about what's happening at the, uh, the front lines of science. And at the same time, scientists should be far more aware of the implications of what they do for the political system and for society and should take greater responsibility for that. Mm. Thanks a lot, Professor Harari, <laughs> Professor Vayana, Kendra, <laughs> Professor Duboche. It was a great honor to spend this evening together. It was enlightening, so re really thanks a lot. And I would just close this panel, so if you want to go back to your seats, <laughs> you are free to do so. Um, we, I would like to thank our supporters tonight, because this event, free event, that has been offered to you, has been, uh, uh, can we see the slides with all our sponsors? Uh, I would like to thank the two, three main sponsors of, the e the, of this evening. We have uh, Banque Landolt, we have SIGPA, and we have Frontiers. Camilla Markram, thanks a lot for your support, because without you, this event would have not been possible. I would like to thank also the Ecole Nouvelle. We talked about a new education system. The Ecole Nouvelle was here, part of our the sponsors. I'm a proud alumni of this school and I really thank you for having supported tonight to welcome Professor Harari. And we have also, <coughs> sorry, Nomads Foundation, the Biopol CXIO Foundation were with us. And of course, the Rada Zocco Foundation, Stefani and Giuseppe Zocco. Thanks a lot for your support. The Bank Julius Baer in Makina Arno Grobe, thanks a lot because really it means a lot. Um, we are on a mission. We have also uh, on this mission our logistical partners, uh, Hotel Royal Savoie in Lausanne, Lausanne Limousine, and also Forge. So on this mission, if you want to be part of it, please go to the next slides and also on the website mfound.org. We need you to come with us and to be also empowered minds because we've discussed tonight, if the debate is not among us, nobody was go we're not, nobody's going to lead it. So if you want to be also a member, if you want to uh, participate in other events like this one, please join us. You go on the website and you can decide to become an empowered member. Professor van der Ginst, please come back to me. We are reaching the end of this evening. I hope you had a great time all together. Professor, I leave you the stage. Thanks a lot. Oops. Well, we promised an evening of questions and surely there were many, many interesting questions today. Uh, there are a few answers as well and some trends. Uh, Leila, you, you started by confessing some uh, lack of optimism uh, at the very beginning of the evening. And, and, and surely there's a little bit of that. And I think maybe in one minute, if I have to summarize everything we said today, it's starting with that. The fact that technology is advancing at such a pace these days that, excuse me the pun, we certainly collectively feel disempowered sometimes. And what we really need to reestablish is this feeling that, in some sense at least, we are in command. And there's two ways that were, several ways, but at least two that were proposed to us today. One I certainly took note for myself is education. 
And not just education in the ivory tower. We need to, meet to, we need to put people in command of these tools. So we need to educate outside of universities, reach out to people. You were saying, Professor Harari, that you would go and make <laughs> a blockbuster at Hollywood or maybe a kid's book. I think these are certainly uh, great tools and great endeavors. We have to reach out to more and more people to explain them the sense of this technology, what we can do, what we can't do, and certainly what we have to pay attention to. And a second aspect was this idea of global cooperation. More than ever, we need that because not a single country can tackle these issues. And the last thing, and that's interesting maybe to mention it as a closing statement on the campus of a university of technology was this idea that humanities form a bridge between technology and the people. And I think certainly here on the campus of EPSL, we have to think more and more about that. We master technology, but maybe we also have to be partner in constructing that bridge that brings technology and empowerment to all of us. Thank you for being here this evening. And we hope to welcome you again at EPFL. There will be many, many more celebrations for our 50th birthday, but certainly this was a very good one. Thank you. Always trying to play me